we have this like quarterly sort of um, webinar series um, that usually has a panel of a few people. Is it, is it what, what do they even call it? I can't remember. So that's been pretty interesting. Um, and then resilience.org is just sort of an ongoing website we run that kind of carries its own content, but also other news from around the world and commentary. There's mm -hmm. a course called Think Resilience. Uh, people sign up for that. And the uh, number of publications. So typically each year it's, there's a report or two that come out, um, book publications as well. So we're basically a think tank on kind of the intersection of basically energy, um, the environment, society. And um, really influence a lot by sort of limits to growth type literature. Yep. Yep. Um, what, uh, on a practical note, one of the things we're looking at, like, uh, one thing we want to push definitely, I mean, solar is available right now, and we're doing some, oh, the, we're building homes and we're including solar energy systems as a standard feature on them. Now, in the future, in, a, in about two years, we were looking at getting into hydrogen systems. Do you guys see hydrogen as an option, or is that you think that's too far out? Well, you know, we actually, energy is really our specialty. So mm -hmm. um, the thing about most of the energy technologies that's interesting is that almost all of them can work. The, the problem becomes scaling them. And, um, and also, um, you know, there's often downsides that are not as well understood when you start going down a path of adopting a technology. And, and they, uh, at, at, at scale, they become really a problem. So, um, so hydrogen, for example, yeah, sure. Anyone, you know, you can do electrolysis in a, in a home lab and capture some of that and, and burn hydrogen, but delivering at volume and distributing through pipelines, um, that, you know, that all becomes a whole different animal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this stuff is very nuanced as opposed to, you know, are we for or against something? It, it's, it's more about, you know, trying to understand that, that it's not all upside and it doesn't always scale very well, you know. Um, and a lot of what we want to do is kind of keep the, keep the scale of, of, of energy use the same or, and grow it. And we've, we figure that's going to be very hard, um, you know, given some of these other other uh, impacts or you know that that happen mm -hmm. and then are often not foreseen not foreseen or not are de-emphasized when they're when you're really promoting these things mm -hmm. so much of what we kind of talk about is the f really understanding how to how to reduce you know the demand of energy and any and and all the just the materials from that come from the environment um, and how you do that and preserve complex modern civilization is sort of a big question that it runs across all our minds. Um, so, yeah. So yeah, that's a lot of what we talk about is how do you, you know, how do you do, how do you do something like if you want to decarbonize the economy and, and eighty five percent of primary energy is fossil fuel based and we don't see renewable scaling to replace that very readily. Um, and the material consequence, if you try to do that, given modern renewables, is quite dramatic. And you can measure things, and you know how many how many gigatons of materials the economy uses in a year, and mm -hmm. trying to then <laughs> replicate that. And so, yeah, I mean, so that's why I think you know it's interesting to think about someone like you who who looks at this more of a how does a village take care of this, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, because maybe that scale there's a lot of the stuff that's really interesting and and will be very helpful for people yeah yeah um <laughs> do, do you mind by the way if i record this so so i can share this with other yeah. team members this discussion yeah um so one of the things we i mean i bring this up i'm a physics background so it's like first principles thinking and given that we have so much more power that comes from the sun to the earth than we use today what what is the post-carbon mindset state about that given that we can blow out through any problems of energy and everything else if we use renewable energies like solar now the the storage question has to be worked out now in my viewpoint yeah. i don't think there is 
uh, like if you talk about storage, uh, nickel iron batteries, Edison batteries. Um, you guys. Yeah, those are amazing. They last a long time. That? Yeah. Uh, yeah, nickel iron is one of the most amazing. I think that's a fascinating technology. It's old and it, they seem to last for so long. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it, and so that's what I say. You can. There's a lot of lot of things like that that are doable. Mm -hmm. You start doing math on saying, okay, if we want to use nickel iron batteries to store uh, and mm -hmm. replace, you know, the the on demand, you, need, you know, things that, that the gas or nuclear or coal does on on or, or hydro on the grid, and and interconnect uh, inter kind of, you know, mass scale mm -hmm. intermittent renewables um, at, a, at a nation state kind of mm -hmm. industrial, modern industrial economy level, it gets very hard to scale that up. And the amount of energy that's going to be required to manufacture those batteries and deploy them and, and re, reconfigure the entire electric grid to do that, it, it becomes really daunting. And I know there's you know, there's really debate in the literature about this. So you have models like, like you know, the, the Stanford guy Jacobson and that group, and then you have, then you have a lot of folks sort of poking holes in that, and and um, like the, like Clack et al. And so there's real debates about this. We we mm -hmm. tend to come down down on the side that that scale, the scale problems are real, and um, and a lot of this stuff. And this is what I also find fascinating about your work. Mm -hmm. A lot of the problems with these 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 renewables is that they're all they often should be thought about as rebuildables. In that you know right now the first generation of, of wind turbines are are becoming landfill issues in in places like Spain. Oh, is that um, so? And so yeah, because you know there's these complex laminates and things, and they're you know resins and plastics and balsa wood and and it's mm -hmm. it's it's. Yeah, stuff, and it's once it starts to gray, and then fiberglass, mm. you know, and and so they end up wearing out, and then they become these big things that have to be decommissioned, um, and mm -hmm. so you start looking at like the the need to deploy this stuff and then replace it. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't build it to last, like a nickel iron mm -hmm. battery or whatever, <laughs> mm -hmm. and make it simple enough that someone yeah repair local that it doesn't require absolutely obscene like cranes and helicopters yeah. and then really is that all going to hold together uh what's the age of these turbines that they're being taken down already was like oh you know, like i think 25 30 years kind of things you know okay yeah yeah so yeah there's solar panels that have problems too put in deserts you know they get corroded faster than you want and so mm-hmm Okay, um, and the issue, so, because so, I am, you know, I'm just saying, oh yeah, well, we need to rework the infrastructures. That's what we do. That's 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 what we do for a living. We we say we're going to rebuild infrastructures. Yeah. Um, so that the energy situation with solar is extremely optimistic for me. But you guys are saying, okay, well, we got to talk about scale issues, and it's not so easy to scale. It's going to take some time. That's that's kind of your perspective, if I'm hearing correct. Yeah, and. You know, it's you can you can do the math is pretty fascinating, honestly. You know, right now, solar, wind, these mm -hmm. things are, are you know, say one percent of mm -hmm. of energy, you know, uh, for electricity. And electricity is twenty five percent of total energy use. So, most of what we actually need to replace is not is is not electrical. Uh, if you're trying to get rid of, get off of fossil fuel. We're going to then say, well, we're going to electrify. We're going to electrify transportation. We're going to, you know, do all these things that will move things into the world of electrification. Well, then all of a sudden your electricity demands go up. So now, now you're asking renewables, not you know, or rebuildable, so to speak, not just to replace the electric, uh, you know, electric generation capacity, but you're asking now to generate to replace the transportation fuels, which is 40 percent of all energy use is transportation oil and diesel and bunker fuels and kerosene um, so that becomes a problem the other big problem becomes in things like um, in, in a lot of industrial manufacturing processes um, are really high they're, they're high heat dependent and um, fossil fuels are unique in how easy it is to just 
fire fire up furnaces with them and generate you know get up to thousand Celsius and and do a lot of th things. It's very hard to do that with electricity. You can of course, but boy the the amount of power you need you know to do that with electricity. What do you mean by that? Very what do you mean difficult. Do that with electricity. Well. <laughs> In other words, at the scale of like heating up a blast furnace using electric. Okay. Okay. You can in small scale, like you know, it's, it's like, you know, where are you gonna get? Where are you gonna, you're gonna put it in batteries first, and then you're gonna like get it, shoot it out of batteries. Batteries hate doing, hate like delivering at that kind of, you know, um, so they end up getting overheated and they end up degrading and. Um, so there's not a lot of, you know, it's very hard to envision how to, how to take fossil fuels or, or, you know, just hydrocarbons. You just call them hydrocarbons. Um, and some of those properties are so unique that it's mm -hmm. very hard to know how to electrify at scale. Yeah. You know. I see. Well, I mean. And it's the difference between like a Tesla and also there's applications. So like if you're driving an electric bike or electric car, you're often driving with on smooth roads and your power, typically the power output is, you know. 15% of the nominal capacity because you're cruising. Mm -hmm. But you have to accelerate now and then. You might like get up to 80%. You yeah. Know? But you put, a, you put a tractor out on the field, you're, you're bouncing around and you're, and you're pulling something. You might be running at 70, 80% of your power you know, capacity much of the day, hours on end. Mm -hmm. And electric systems hate that. You know, they just hate having to like deliver that we upsize everything so vastly yeah. to do it yeah batteries hate that yeah for the industrial power replacement because the induction furnace is part of the technologies that we have we so steel is going to have to be part of a modern civilization the way we think about it is i mean what what is your thought on because i see a clear solution to that the simple solution is run in the daytime and if you've yeah, got i know so make hay as a sunshine Right. Do you guys believe that too, or that, or that's never going to happen? I think it's just it's just a simple mind shift. It means that your plant is not running twenty four hours; it's running eight yeah. hours. Yeah. No, that's really that's really important, and that's the question: is how is that doable? The problem becomes with a lot of these um, a lot of these plants; uh, they run twenty four seven because the it's like it's like getting the oven up to temperature. Yes, yeah, sure. It takes a huge amount of power, and then you cool it down and yeah. So that's the problem. It's very hard to cycle these these some of these industrial processes. They have to they have to kind of go constantly, or they come or become so yeah. inefficient. Sounds like a case for industrial productivity on a small scale. <laughs> well, that's why I found you fascinating because I throw up my hands when I go. I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah. And you and your guys are thinking like, well. Maybe we can get this at a scale where these tools are useful and, and around, and a lot of it's going to be recycling, of course. And um, yeah, so I think we also share the thread. To having of, mine. Yeah, share. We I think we should both share the concept. I hear you talking about circular economies. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've got only good news here. So let's start the podcast. <laughs> okay. Now here's what I'm going to do too. <laughs> is um, I'm going to also just put my voice recorder on my yeah. phone and put it next to me, just in case. I'm going to put it right next to me. Yeah. Because um, I don't, that'll pick up me, so I don't know if you have the ability to just put a little phone mic next to you. I'm, I'm recording, so this and, will uh, capture the audio as we hear it. Okay, great. So I can, okay, I have a, we have a backup. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start recording on Squadcast. we got backups on both sides. And I have to ask you a simple question to start out. When I see your name, uh, I think like French, Marcin. It's but Martian. That may not be it. How do you, Marcin? Okay, yeah. So Marcin. Polish has a different different. Yeah, Marcin. Marcin. Cool. This is the Polish Marcin. pronunciation. Yeah. In English, and I then, say uh, like Marcin to the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's easy now. Uh, Marcin, yeah. and then is it uh, Jakubowski? Yeah. How do you say that? Jakubowski. Okay. Pretty good. Jakubowski, Marcin Jakubowski. Close. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, oh, we got a doggy. Oh, okay, let me let me uh, shut the dog down. Hold on.
Uh, sorry about that. Okay. No problem. Okay, there we go. Sounds like a little terrier or something. Yeah, it is a little terrier. <laughs> yeah, those little guys. Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay, so but just the show's going to go. We're going to talk about these topics. We're going to have a little break, and then we're going to come in, and we're going we're to sort of say, yeah, you know, coming up, you know, I'm going to we're going gonna to interview uh, Marcin Jakubowski of Open Source Ecology, and I'll give a little preamble. So I'm going to just kind of dive in with you, and you just know that I've kind of done an introduction, yeah. okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, great. So, um, hi, Marcin. Um, really happy to, to meet you. Um, in this crazy town episode, like we talk about, is about complexity and its cousin specialization, like job specialization. Um, and we kind of we kind of discuss how societies have evolved to become more complex over time. And there's a lot more knowledge in the world, um, a lot more people that do things that you can't imagine doing yourself because they're, they're just they're specialists. And this leads oh, to the yeah. situation I think I find myself right where. I don't understand how the world works, mm. and it's just a, sort of this big organism, right? That's moving along. Huh. So anyway, um, I find it fascinating to watch what you're doing because you're ch you're trying to sort of break like industrial civilization down into these like component machines, you know, the fifty things you need. Yeah. And uh, and so um, whereas I look at industrial civilization and I see that it's just part of maybe this, this what's happened at all these societies where they become fragile as they become more complex mm, yeah and end up in the storm not persisting you know um, so anyway I wanted to talk to you in this sort of do the opposite segment of the show because we want to get into what individuals or societies might do um, to be the opposite of what it's done in the past which is ever more complex trade networks, yeah. ever more complex and sort of incomprehensible technologies um, and urbanization. And I know you, mm. you live on a farm like I do. So anyway, um, can you talk to us about your life's path and your work and how that sort of fits into this do the opposite in the context of social complexity and specialization? Right. So um, I got up to far flung degrees up to a PhD in physics and the, the notion there was solutions for simple pressing world issues. I come from Poland. My grandparents were in a Polish underground World War II concentration camps. Okay, not a good idea. Communism, <laughs> then democracy, uh, coming to America in 1982. But I saw this stark difference between here's one country that is deprived and here's another country that's prosperous and what's the difference the difference in operating system it's a difference in in the governance structures and everything else because everyone has the same resources we all have rocks sunlight plants soil water that's where all the wealth comes from mm. so um, so let's talk about education to get us as capable humans trying to make a better world for everybody I got very disappointed the farther I went in my education because I was feeling more and more useless. And that's that's why I started this mm. project to actually try to make a difference. And the I want to go right directly to the co connection of that to open source and open collaboration, okay. which is what we're about. Our mission is collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. So we live in a world that's pretty complex. But a lot of that has to deal with that kind of transparency and open sourceness of the world where in many ways we confuse things, obfuscate things by design. It's part of the hidden structural evils we have here, you can say. So there's like things like, you know, um, patenting and, and then making things yeah. like maybe even they're going to break after a while so you buy another or, yeah. you know, it's really hard to repair. Yes, those are manifestations of this phenomenon on a product level, and products mm -hmm. are economies. So we live in a completely proprietary economy. And when you think about uh, the state of art in human learning, there's no such thing. Because, in, because everything is proprietary, you always get to learn the next to best stuff. Mm. Nobody shares the best information. Someone's got the best thing, they patent it. It's a, 
it's a really profound yeah. issue in society that we don't really see it. We think we're innovating, Google, Amazon, and all this stuff. We are in a stone right. age of innovation. We're causing more problems right now than we're um, solving. Yeah. And yeah, no, that's very interesting. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I think that's the status of things. We have to be honest to recognize it, but most people don't recognize that co-op, cooperation, collaboration does not exist. And you can get into collaboration, what is it? And, and um, yeah, but that's, that's kind of... Yeah, so that's a complete interrupt. opposite of the idea that, yeah, that, that sort of private self-interest and greed will, will motivate people and teams of people to innovate and, and solve problems. And you're saying, well, Kind of, but also it also says it's also part of the system that then mm -hmm. says, "Well, I have to keep it to myself. I can't share it openly." And and I, you know, what makes me think of the pandemic, right? Why wasn't yeah. there a complete open source on the vaccines? You know, uh, and, you and know everybody could share the. <laughs> and did yeah. you hear the one from Sweden or some Nordic country? They had it months ago. They had an open version, and then the government mm -hmm. went with a proprietary version because that's the way funding works. You can uh, basically mm -hmm. the interests went towards the big industrial uh, interests of pharmaceutical companies as opposed to healing that essentially for free, like less profit. Yeah. And this is one of those things that are just like right now in the, in the current world, it's, it's abominab abominable how that happens, but that's just one of the manifestations that I think a lot of people can connect to it because right now people are dying because of, because of, of this feature of how the, the, the vaccine has been rolled out. Because yeah. nobody has access in the third world right now, for example. Yeah. And, in, yeah, and, in, and in the US, for your, it's interesting because you talk about the, the access to land and plants and water. And right now in the US, not only are most people like don't, don't really understand their technology that they're yeah. using every day. I could I couldn't fix I couldn't fix a toaster or make yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. And um, but but we also most people live in cities and don't even know how to grow a potato. Right. Um. So it's interesting because you live on a farm and you're sort of setting this up so that you can you call it the global village construction set. So I'm kind of curious, you know, um, is what what's your vision? Do you see these sort of smaller scale communities having the technology to be a, a, you know more kind of self-sufficient in the context of that community i envision a world of distributed uh basically distributed economies so that mm -hmm. any city or village like in history uh, at the dunbar scale like 200 people and up and units of that you can have a full right. complete economy from that but the missing link is where do you get the information? Where do you get smart people and train people to do the actual modern day civilization stuff? That needs to be open and now it's not. So we're working on open sourcing all of that uh, to make the world better mm -hmm. and, and basically leapfrog through all the issues of poverty, wars and, and other structural evils that exist and resource artificial yeah. scarcity that, that is pervasive in our societies. So yes, absolutely yeah. take, take any technology and any technology can be done on a smaller scale or it can be done cleanly. It's what mm -hmm. your motives are. So I, I'd like to ask you real quick, you know, there's, you, you promote these 50 machines for yeah. this global village construction set. And the idea is that with these 50, you can sort of make all the other things you need, yeah. right? Um, how did you come up with those? That's about curious. right. So, <laughs> so you look at, uh, so the product selection, selection metric, you can read more about it on a wiki, I can send you the link. But the idea is take all the current things that a human uses today, like, okay, you gotta get, grow some food, you might need a tractor, mm -hmm. you might need, mm -hmm. need to move, move around to work, you might need a car, you might need to produce the goods that you use, you need some fabrication capacity. So you just go through a list of, okay, this is what we do every day trillion dollar enterprises mm -hmm. and say okay let's open source each one of them one by one and how do we uh, so if we have a kernel then 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 you can use that to rebuild any civil any uh, community enterprise yeah such as a farm or anything from scratch now let me just tell, talk to you uh, how that thinking has evolved we evolved way into the construction set approach so yes as you said you can build anything with the tools because a lot of the tools are productive tools such as here's how you get steel from scrap metal virgin steel mm. or other productive tools like precision machining to get engines yeah. out of that steel okay so you can go from mm -hmm. junkyard to to tractor 
on a small scale. Yeah. And what's the scale that it takes? Oh, it's just a few thousand square foot workshop plus information. This, this is talking about information age, digital age technology, automation, CNC, 3D printers, uh, modern technology that allows you to do it very easily. In fact, a solution for, you talked about, um, one might say, oh, you'll never get agriculture off the grid because you need a lot of, lot of fuel to do that. Well, what about autonomous solar tractors that do the same work mm -hmm. autonomously, but with net present renewable energy from the sun? That's completely feasible. That's one of the things we're working on. So you add now automation oh, to the to the old equations, and because we have so much solar power, there is no shortage. If you now start thinking a little differently and say, oh, okay, we can do it in a different way. Uh, so, for example, if you got to plow a whole field, if you want to do that, if you're not at permaculture yet, um, mm -hmm. do it with an autonomous tractor that's solar. It just unfolds its its wings of solar arrays like a, like a satellite in space. Mm -hmm and goes at half a mile per hour instead of 10 miles yeah, you per don't hour. Care. Right, so right, you right. go 50 times slower, but if you're autonomous, that doesn't, that's even, it doesn't hurt you. Right. It might take you a few right. days, but um, it'll still work. You've got a whole year to plow that field once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of curious about this because some of the stuff you t mentioned, like solar panels, I think about, um, you know the factories that make those components, right? The um, the photovoltaic cells, yeah, uh, semiconductor type components. Yeah, I sort of wondered myself, could we be making these things that will last hundreds of years, right? Because one of the things I worry about is a lot of renewable systems end up degrading, and I'm sort of curious about that. And yes, you know, like 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 wind turbines. Can you make wind turbines that? you with your equipment could build but also easily repair and refurbish as opposed to the kind of the giant ones now that require helicopters and huge cranes and are made of 20 different you know materials um so yeah what, what's your thought about that the answer is absolutely but you have to design that now who's going to design that mm -hmm. not the industry today because of short term, -term yeah. profits this is you talking about designing it so it's free design it so it's a hundred year lifetime so for example on a tractor on the tractor, we use modular power units as an example, just to give you an example. So the, the engine goes yeah. out. Oh, that's how I, I got into this. My engine uh, transmission went out, paid 2000 bucks to get it repaired. It broke again a week yeah. after. And I said, no, I cannot do this if I want to talk about a sustainable farm and, and settlement. So we redesigned. We just said, okay, well, what's a tractor? It's a box with wheels, some hydraulic power. That's a very flexible source. Make the power units modular. So. I've, I've gone through a couple of replacements where uh, the power, power unit goes out, pick it up with a hoist, yeah. put a new one in, bam, zero downtime, you're going again. How long right. is this tractor going to last? It's going to last 100 years. It de it's going to last as long as I decide. It's got mm -hmm. modular wheel units, modular engine units. So it's a design principle of design for disassembly, modularity. Now you can do the same kind of thinking for your wind turbine. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. Make it maybe out of modular stackable sections that you can easily take up or something. Or go to maybe slightly smaller ones, but not the right. huge, huge ones, but slightly smaller. And then you're going to say, oh, what about this high tech like a PV panel? Well, I'd right. say 25 to 40 years, that's pretty good for now. But mm -hmm. when you design it, make sure you're designing the recyclability infrastructures into that. Um, Otherwise, you're talking about sand. You're talking about sand uh, that's turned into silicon, that's doped with minute amounts of stuff, and that's yeah. your raw material. You've got plastic around it, you've got aluminum around that. Aluminum is highly recyclable. What is that, the, the sheet cover, is that PVA or something? The, it's yeah, a thermal plastic <laughs> that's also recyclable. Uh -huh. um, the panels, if they degrade, crush them up and uh, re re smelt them again into the ingot crystals. So think that way. You're very deliberate about where is it going to go after its useful life. And yes, yeah. absolutely, it's just a different way of thinking. And if you ever want to liberate society from having to work too much, it's just a prerequisite. A technologically yeah. uh, circular economies plus the ability to make things live as long as you like, the products that we use. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's a huge value proposition and a clear 
uh, case for the next economy that we're working on, this is inevitable. It's like at some point people are going to say, this is just too much. Why are we trashing everything after one hour lifetime of an object? Ridiculous. Yeah. It makes no sense. And people yeah. just haven't caught up to that yet. We're not there yet, but it's inevitable. No, I think people are questioning the sense of the whole thing and, you know, what am I spending my life force doing and is yeah. my job, is my job uh, actually have any meaning at all, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, so many people will be really excited about what you're doing. Like, I come from uh, a biological background, so I threw myself, when I started thinking about this, you know, I threw myself into becoming a farmer and um, my mind went to like, geez, without fossil fuels, you know, okay, Maybe there's some biofuels, but then I start thinking about the industrial design and, and manufacturing process and how globalized that is. And you can't, you can't fix your tractor nowadays legally even if you buy it new. And I just said, well, maybe I should be doing horse farming or something. But I think for you, it's interesting that you come from this physics background and you decided to tackle like, okay, um, let me tackle these tool sets, these industrial tools. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that amazing because I, I might... I myself am the kind of person I might blame industrialization for the mess we find ourselves in. And you seem to be in this sort of thing, no, it's, it's not necessarily industrialization per se, it's the scale it went to, it's sort of the ownership structures, it's the fact that people mm -hmm. don't have control of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you seem to be trying to embrace the benefits of, this, of modern technologies for manufacturing in the context of the right scale and ownership of it. Is that, is that a fair description of sort of where you've ended up? Tools are tools. You can use them for good or evil. Uh, yeah. Tools are powerful. Right now we have more power than at any time in history to turn the, turn the tools around, and that's what we're doing. Uh, you talk about 50 machines that have pr productivity machines and production machines as the core of the set. Talk about uh, demystifying that. Mm -hmm. um, that needs to happen. It's a prerequisite for a democratic society. Newsflash, yeah. newsflash, we need to master our technology before we become free as humans or independent as humans. We cannot have democracy when small numbers of people and unjust governance structures control the way technology rolls out today. No, people have to do it. So, um, the thing is, the, the massive breakthrough on my side is, it's like, holy cow, I can understand all of this, actually. Like, okay, so I started building stuff and get, getting intense into that. But then you start finding patterns. It's like, mm -hmm. holy cow. So now, so there's 50 machines, okay, they can get you a lot yeah. of 80% of the industrial economy. Um, wait, but what are these tools made of? So now we have on the wiki, we've got the 50 tools and 500 modules. So what are the other modules mm -hmm. that you need? basic building blocks of everything it will be mm -hmm. things like here's a hydraulic valve here's a shaft a ball bearing a circuit mm -hmm. so you can go down to about 500 or so primitives that if you to give you an example anything you get on amazon like most of the consumer goods from your appliances to cordless drills to to humidifiers what are they um, when you start looking at it, we got plastic, we got an electric motor, we've got a microcontroller, we got some wires, maybe a little metal case. It's like, okay, reconfigure those in different configurations, wires through which current runs, creates forces. Uh, there's only a, a limited amount of, of components that say this thousand or ten thousand products are made of. Now the good news today yeah. is you can take a 3D printer and print that plastic structure. You can take a CNC circuit mill and create the little microcontroller that's in there. You can take metal, metal processing infrastructure, milling or cutting to get whatever the, the metal parts are. For wires, that's, that's called wire drawing, that's a metal processing technology. So. There's only so many things you need. That's the cool yes. thing. There's like 500 things. If you master those, you know all of technology and you can start talking about going to Mars. Interesting. It's fat because we, we start off the show talking about this guy in um, Great Britain who, I don't know, it's like 10 years ago, 
you know, tried to build a toaster from scratch. Yeah. You're familiar with that, yes. that story? Yes. And so I'm wondering, like, if you took the toaster challenge, you think you could have done it? Of course. Uh, so <laughs> I was just talking, um, so a collaborator from South Africa, yeah. just to give you an example of how this works. Let's go yeah. back to what I said before. Rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, water. Rocks. What are rocks? Well, it happens that my buddy in South Africa has got some ferrochrome. Hey, what is that? Hey, that's the stuff that stainless steel is made of. You put some of that into your iron pile and you got stainless steel. So there's an example. I got, I got you the stainless steel. I'll roll it with a metal roller and create a thin sheet out of it. And uh, mm -hmm. I got my case for that, that toaster. Uh, I take mm -hmm. nickel, a common element. I take chromium. Ferrochrome, that, hey, that already comes out of that ferrochrome I just mentioned. You can make nickel mm -hmm. uh, nichrome wire. That's your heater element, and so forth. You can extract copper out of the, the ground. Hey, they've been doing that for thousands of years. Copper tools, there's a copper, whenever copper happened, what was that, like 10, 5, 10,000 years ago? Um, steel came in, what, like a couple of thousand years ago? Uh, that they first started making steel things. It's all in the dirt. <laughs> and now you have... Yeah, uh, or it's in our land, landfills or whatever. Landfill. Now. It's in streams. Yeah. You can put an electric cu current through a stream and take out little micro elements out of that, like all, all kinds mm -hmm. of... Man, it's all, it's all there. It's, uh, but, but here's the deal. We are completely illiterate, enumerate, and scient scientifically uh, yeah. illiterate. And I can say that myself because I left my PhD program and I was completely clueless. I went to a you were farm. very specialized. <laughs> you were, <laughs> and I you were hyper specialized. Well, now you become yeah. a generalist. Yeah, and That's here's a here's a good deal. Um, my my message for the world is that this is completely doable because, as I said, once you learn one thing, you'll see that the next thing you learn is going to take you half the time. The next thing you yeah. learn is going to take you a quarter of the time, and before you know it, you're Michelangelo, <laughs> Renaissance man. But mm -hmm. everything in society takes us away from that, and I think this is like one of the greatest uh, evils in society. Like we are, like John Taylor Gattos has a book called Dumbing Us Down <laughs> about the elementary school mm -hmm. system. Hey, this is yeah. what society does, unfortunately. Um, you know, we still have hope in high school that you know, we can do some good things. By college time, it's all getting into the proprietary world where now it's like all the proprietary guys start funding your education and stuff like that, and you don't learn the state of art <laughs> stuff because you don't get that, sorry, in today's civilization. Yeah. Uh, so there's a systematic way where we're just depressed as a civilization on a big scale. So we need to open up education and, and recreate education where people are learning more generalist skills and hands-on, and that's, that's exactly what yeah. we're actually trying to do. So we're... We're actively teaching that. You can come for a three-month immersion program starting this September, or you can take a one-year, we're starting actually, our one-year on-site immersion program. Learn to build a, a state-of-art center. It's uh, The way we operate here is it's, a, it's an R&D center. But create that. It's like a campus, like a campus with a farm, with a micro factory, with all the various you're elements of a village. And do yeah, that so you're like... You've got this site in Missouri, and you it's a farm with 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 these shops and and buildings, and you run you run courses and and so tell us a little bit how would people find out more about this? Announcement is so we're, we've been shut down from COVID, but we're we're starting yeah. back up in, on September first through December. December first is going to be our three month immersion. So for this thing, this is where. So we've been developing this thing called the Seed Eco Home. It's a, in order to make affordable, ecological housing widely accessible. It builds on the tools that we develop and just the open source techniques, uh, all kinds of things. But we're actually starting to teach people how to build homes. That's I mean, a definite good market, and we're we're including the renewable energy, like the photovoltaics. In fact, seven kilowatts of that as a standard feature on all our homes. And we're, yeah, anyway, but, but you can get trained to actually, it's like tech school, but more like visionary tech school with a definite growth track. You can take, start yeah. with the three months to do, learn how to build, learn how to wield tools, and then get into, okay, let's start learning how to design and then how to do enterprise around that. So that's the, 
that's a very explicit program where we're training builders. Now, we call this event, the September event, it's called the Summer of Extreme Design Build. So it's got several tracks. One is the building, the, the house builders. But the other tracks are, okay, let's build tractors, CNC torch tables, mm. renewable energy systems, and aquaponic greenhouses, and more. You name it. Learn how to build anything. So if anyone wants to uh, become unstoppable and immortal yeah. in their productivity, join <laughs> us for a year or start with the three months. Also, we're in that same time, we're including short courses, which are 14 days for... If you want to go through the whole process of how you build a house and all the modules. This house I live in is actually, it's modular. The panels are mm -hmm. typically four by eight panels. So once again, like we talked about, how do you make that windmill last a lifetime? Build it modularly. Every part can be replaced. And that's how this house is designed. Yeah. And that's how the house that we're teaching about will be designed, is designed. Um, but that's, that's what you can learn. Okay, so if anyone wants to find this, you know, just search open source ecology and you'll, you'll get their website and there will be announcements on that. Announcing, yes, so right now you can sign up for our email list, but as far as the, the actual announcements, so we're, we're getting close here. It's about a week we're publishing that. So uh, very early okay. April, we're going to publish the formal announcement for the three month, the short Great. courses. And also for people who just have a weekend and want to get a taste of what this is like. How would you feel about building yeah. a house over a weekend? We do that. This house was built in five days with 50 people. We use swarm build techniques, yeah. so it's a highly collaborative uh, group-based build method based on open techniques and modular design. What does modular mean? It means that many parts can be made in parallel and then assembled rapidly into place, and that's how we can build our tractors in a single day. Mm. I talked about five, and yeah. I, took me five, and I built a tractor in five days. We got that down to one. It's crazy. This stuff works. Technology oh, works. Um, learn more about it. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, fascinating to speak to someone who's got that, that kind of optimism and skill set you do related to technology. So um, really interesting uh, mm -hmm. sort of voice and um, and gives, gives people with that kind of interest and desire uh, a, an amazing outlet. Yeah. So thank you so much for all your work, and I really appreciate having you here on Crazy Town. Thank you, Jason. Excellent. Okay, I'll stop recording now. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little taste of what we've got. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, how long have you been on that farm? Since 2006. Okay. Do you grow stuff yourself? Right. You're, you're a farmer. What do you grow? Yeah. What are you growing? I have a CSA, so a lot of different things. Um, and I, I, I'm doing my last CSA delivery for this season. Um, and I got a lot of potatoes. <laughs> for <laughs> so this I'm season? Getting, getting uh, the well, I, I go from like early May through March. Next year, I probably only going to go through February. It's kind of it was a little... A little much to go through March, so year round. Um, March. We do like, so in the yeah, winter, the so-called winter. You, you're growing stuff. Well, some, but mostly it's like taking stuff out of storage. Yeah. Um, so I've a, built a cellar and things like that. And, do and then you I, that, I'm buying stuff from a neighboring farm. Do you do a lot of that, that work? You've got a bunch of staff, or do you still are you still still out there in the field a lot? Oh uh, yeah, not it's a small small operation. So I get help. Um, my son helped me out. I get students from the local university. So my farm is partnering with the local university, and the students have their own their own um, sort of fields on campus, and and so we actually distribute off uh, uh, on a campus facility, and um, so I'm kind of augmenting the the farms that the students run and and sometimes I you know, I'll have them out to help me out so that's been really nice been neat to talk to them and yeah what city are you close to what um, university Dallas Oregon so it's Oregon State University yeah yeah what about you what's the closest city Kansas City to you? okay yeah uh, Kansas I was city. in Missouri I was yeah, yeah I was in St Louis for a long time yeah. Is, is I didn't really get over to Kansas City much, you know, it's, it's other side of the state, like five yeah, or six hours, I think, to get there. Yeah, yeah. So, 
as far as the the farm work is that that your main job or do you do you do something else for a living well i'm fortunate in that my wife is a physician so mm -hmm. this this the farming i do would not pay mm -hmm. for you know much of <laughs> <laughs> for much of what uh, we need in terms of like you know a house and with with a, a note on it and all that mm -hmm. um but it is nice in that uh yeah the, the lifestyle is fantastic getting to um interact with people and teach people and yeah. you know help feed my family and um and i'm around the home all the time so i can do the do the laundry and keep up with you know make meals so my really busy physician wife is just happy that you know i don't have some some career where I, I drive away drive away to a job and i'm stressed out and get back at the same time she does exhausted yeah so um, uh, have you heard of badger said research have i heard what badger said research mm -mm. hazelnut yeah. breeding so we're actually doing some of that work here too we've got uh, oh. breeding grade hazelnuts for the midwest you guys have um Production. The, the, we're the, basically this is once again 500 year plan. This is natural swarm breeding. Uh, you select out yeah. over multiple generations. It's guided guided genetic manipulation without GMOs. Mm -hmm. But I actually wouldn't mm -hmm. be super opposed to G, genetic modification there, um, like if it's done yeah. appropriately. So imagine you've got yeah, crops yeah, that can really good. yield, you know, like hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the vision from Badger Set Research that's Phil. Phil, um, Phil Rudder. Is it in Wisconsin? Yeah. Wisconsin? Yeah, those guys. Okay, and they're yeah. saying, okay, instead mm -hmm. of corn and soybeans, we've got hazelnuts and chestnuts. There we go. Yeah. So that's yeah. another one of those We're solutions. huge into hazelnuts around here. Yeah, hazelnuts are huge around here. It's that we're the 98% of the hazelnuts in the North America are grown in, grown in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, where I'm at. Now, and so it's fascinating. Is, is that like where you don't have the blight? Because the is that like blight resistant species or simply the blight didn't get there no. or something? No, I think it just has to do with a couple of things. We happen to be a place that grows hazelnuts better than most other places in the world. And so, you know, in, in agriculture, crops tend to go to places that are the most productive relative to cost. So that, that happens to be our climate. Um, we're a very unique place. We grow most of the grass seed in the United States as well. So there's and cover crop seed, hmm. a lot of vegetable seed. And it has to do with the fact that we have, we have a pretty rainy winter, but then we do have a dry summer. So we have, it's like a wet Mediterranean climate. Hmm. So we reliably can harvest when it's dry, which makes a huge difference in terms of the reliability of getting a crop. Hmm. So that's how, that's why it's so important. So the hazelnuts drop onto the ground and they drop on the ground here and it's dry ground. And whereas other place parts of the world, you know, it's, it's who knows how wet it is and what the grass is like and what kind of molds might be there. And they hear the nice dry ground when they fall. And it's bush hazelnuts? And get them clean. Uh, they, tend to, they tend to be managed in different ways. Um, the older, older orchards are taller and you know, they're pretty good sized trees. They're, trying, they're, tending to, they're starting to grow them tighter together. And, so it's tree uh, hazels? And some are talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the European filbert is what it you know, was. But you don't have the, because I mean, with Phil Rudder and Badger said, it's all about breeding out the filbert blight, eastern filbert, right? Filbert yeah. blight, which I guess you they guys do They work on that here. Have. They use, no, we have. And so what's happening is there's this race between the breeders and the blight. And so oh. there's what's called marker assisted breeding. So they, at the university here, they, they try to find, you know, the, the genotypes that are most resistant and, and get those into the standard varieties, you know, um, and trying to constantly improve them. But the, the, the fungus keeps evolving. I see. So that is an issue, but it's not, it is also responsible yeah, and the for main some. Thing it's, some crop loss from that or like yes in fact some of the older orchards that, that um that weren't managed as well because it kind of got in first and they're mm. bigger trees and they're harder to manage they're some of those are being taken out and you can see the blight on them now what's interesting about the blight though is that this is why they're getting to smaller trees they're trying to crop them because the blight comes in from the tips and works its way back so you actually can see it 
and you just cut the branch off. You should just, so there needs to be aggressive pruning. And if huh. you prune the branches off that have blight, it won't spread in your orchard. Huh. So it's more eyes, eyes on, you know, pruning is, huh. and some are saying like, these are, these are very good to coppice. So just oh, yeah. every, maybe every five years, just cut them all the way down to the ground and have a rotation like that. And that'll probably keep your blight out and then have more hedge, hedge production type. There's your answer to your biofuel. Yeah, I think that's a, that's something that I'm really interested in. Is my farm is developing some more um, perennial and permanent crop systems. And um, right now, the way I manage my soil is I have most of the acres is actually in pasture, and I have I have I, I lease it out to a guy who runs sheep. And um, and then I periodically rotate into pasture, and so that that's really good for the soil. And mm -hmm. but I don't I don't I, I want to develop a plan where I grow. Um, crops that I can do for coppice wood and and perennials um, of various kinds of permanent crops and I, I just haven't gotten to that yet. You're developing your operation still so you've got uh, mo much more time on that or you're gonna get out yeah, of Yeah I just or? got the farm in 2000, 2018 I got the farm so okay. right yeah. next to my house so it's very nice 100, 100 acres right next to my house it's beautiful. Yeah how much is land out there? Oh it's expensive um, my place has irrigation rights and good good tillable soil, so it's probably worth like twelve thousand an acre of the tillable land. And then we've got forest, you know, some riparian zones that are forested, and that sells for a lot less for some reason. But um, but yeah, it's twelve thousand acres, pretty steep. Yeah. And it seems to be going up just because there's a lot of cheap cheap money right now out there, and people with money are chasing tangible assets and. They don't. They don't need to buy any more stuff. They just have to, they have to buy stuff that's supposed to give them cash flow. So how it's, many, this, it's this real scheme. How many? How many customers do you have? How many? Uh, we have 45, 45 CSA members. What's the? Can you tell me a little bit about the economics of that? So what's the? What's the share cost for the year? The share cost twelve hundred dollars. Um, it. It's super marginal at my scale. Um, I I think you know I could be a lot better off if I had you know a plastic hoop house, which I really I hate those things in some ways. But boy, you could grow so much stuff that would be really valuable in the off season, like the like the greens, just keeping keeping people with with fresh greens year round. Mm -hmm. I could get those to grocery stores and. That would probably be a way to really like make make more money. Um, right now, it's rough. I'm still building my tool set out and um, getting better at what I'm doing. So we'll see. Um, I'm hoping to find some some valuable cash crops like um, like doing seeds, vegetable seeds, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So you can make you can make a decent living on you know a half acre of vegetable seeds. But uh, you got to get into the market. They got people got to know you, trust you. You got to vegetable know seeds. So you got to be got to clean. Growing yeah. things for seed. Yeah, growing things for seeds. Seeds like you know might be worth hundred bucks a pound wholesale. A lot of these things, and you might get thousand pounds an acre. You know, so. Um, so that ends up being like way more valuable than, than food. <laughs> you think about the value per acre. So I have a friend, for example, who does something like I, I do, but he took his entire greenhouse or hoop house. They're not glass closed in, but they're these, these sort of shelters. Um, and he's growing tomatoes. None of the tomatoes are to eat. They're all for seed. Mm. So it makes me way more money than, than feeding people tomatoes. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but that provides the tomato seed for all the other farmers. And when you're, when you're in season, how, how is your work day? It's long hours or how many hours a week do you yeah. work throughout? Um, God, it's hard to keep track. What's really nice about farming is that you, um, you're kind of going between things that are cognitively challenging and make you slow down because you're planning and you're you're executing and you got to be really precise. And then you're switching task switching to things that are kind of mindless and um, and physical. 
So I really like that about it. Um, and then in the off season, you're doing a lot of planning. You know, you're you're getting your se your seeds lined up. You're planning your crops for the season. You're planning where they're going to go, the, the layout, the design of the farm, and mm -hmm. then you know, a lot of spreadsheets and stuff. And and then calendarizing act activities. I use an open source software called Farm OS to kind of track what I'm doing and plan a bit. And uh, how's that? How what's your experience with it? Is Farm OS good? I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. I think it's pretty good. It's gotten better too. There's more features that are helpful, mm -hmm. like the calendar features, kind of new. Their their um, app their app hasn't worked for me on my phone, but um, otherwise I've liked. What do you use that for? Um, well, I'll um, I basically use it to record activities, and the, and then also you can plan activities. So you might say. Um, when do I need to sow these seeds? What's the window that I need to sow these seeds so that I can make this harvest? So you can start from the harvest and say, okay, if I need to harvest here, because I'm trying to target target harvest, let's say, of green beans, you know, in mid-September, mm -hmm. right? And, um, well, they're going to take 75 days from planting to be ready. Okay, I'm going to back up. Okay, when do I need to plant them? I'm going to direct seed them. Um, great. And you can back up again and say, okay, when does that? When does the area need to be ready to see? Great, to get ready to see, what I need to do? Okay, I need to I need to do some cultivation. I might want to pre-irrigate, sprout some weeds, cultivate again. Okay, I need three weeks ahead of when I'm seeding all out in Farm OS as a set of activities you need to do, and it will show up on a calendar. Now you start doing that for every crop, and suddenly you start seeing the path, you know what your activities need to be. And you might say, shit, that day's got. I'm doing everything that day, so you might need a micro shift, or, or you, you can treat it more like, you know, this week is the kind of when I need to get this stuff done, right? All these things, mm -hmm. um, as opposed what, to saying, okay, and, and no, no days precious, let's say, right? What's what's so the recording part? Important. You say you record things with it, taking notes or videos, or yeah. It's, oh no, for me it's like a database entry. You can you can with your camera supposedly, although I haven't gotten to work. Do field observations where you take a picture and you and you lo upload that picture. Mm -hmm. you know, so notes, you just take notes and it's just a database, a field database. Yeah, and I don't even, I don't even, yeah, I often don't even take notes. I just say, like, I'll go, home, I'll get home at the end of the day, and I'll and I'll go into it, and I'll just basically like there was an activity that's like the activity was on the calendar. It said you will plant your potatoes today and I go do it and then I just go in and I record it as done you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing or you or you or you do stuff unplanned you just have to do it and you got to go in and make a record you just start from scratch make a record back you know back dated so it's primarily a calendaring thing yeah database too so you want to look something up you know on lists you can do lists and you could say Show all my activities that are related to planting. Show all my activities related to harvesting. Show all my activities related to tillage. Show all my activities related to fertilizing. Mm -hmm. And that's really helpful because I'm certified organic. Mm -hmm. And so if when I get an inspection, you're know, like, "What did you do and why?" It's like, "Oh, what do you want to know about? Tell me about this. Tell me about your beets, your beet crop." Okay, there's all the records of beets. How much does the software so cost? So it's really nice, uh, free, but uh, I pay seventy-five bucks a year to have it hosted for me. Hmm. So it's open source and, and you can have it hosted yeah. or hosted yourself. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's pretty just worth 75 bucks yeah. to have someone do it for me. That's you probably cool. the kind of person who would love to host it yourself. Yeah, if I get somebody to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. you're not into that so much. <laughs> yeah. So that's been good. It's been good, um, and I'm building a. Well, I, we're work, We're building a pedal tractor. Um, so it's an electric hybrid. It's using an electric motor, um, mm -hmm. and the, the we gauge is the motor. Yeah. Well, um, if you want to help us um, uh, or get experience building tractors that are engine powered, you you can learn yeah. that this summer. We're we're going to be very near actually to product release. So the kind the cool. we did a micro track. And that one is very close. So at the end of the year, okay. you'll probably recommend it for replication by others. And if you want to go yeah. and play with 
the actual solar autonomous thing, we're going to be working on that this summer too, during the summer of extreme design build. So, a micro tractor that kind of crawls in weeds would be really nice. With that, that, would be really nice. that does the weeding for weeds. you. Weeds, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be the use case? The use case, of course, but the the functionality there would it have a vision, computer vision, to identify the weeds. Or would you just say well, follow or, this these beacons or? Yeah, you could do it two ways. You could get really fancy and do computer vision, or you could just sort of say, you know, go through. I don't this. know if you could say like go through this path, which is like I got carrot row here, carrot row here, get everything in between. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what's so. what's your tolerance? Let's think about that. So, what's your spacing and uh, how how accurate do you have yeah, to be? Yeah, I think it's, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the crops quite a bit and the stage of the crops. So some crops are spaced, you know, five feet apart in rows. And some people will plant crops really tight, like six inches. And it depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Microgreens are really tight, you know. Yeah. So winter squash is really well spaced. Potatoes are really well spaced. What about, you know, so have you, are you doing or have you done microgreens? I have not, no. Those are pretty, pretty viable, though, but I have never done those. That would be pretty profitable, right? Mm -hmm. Those are pretty profitable. High turnover. Yeah, you have to really be like always, you know, on a very tight schedule. You go through a lot so of seed. For, so you're always seeding. So for that, it's, is that something you want to get into or or it's not a priority? Um, not a priority. And the reason is, is that as soon as you do microgreens, people also are expecting triple washing and bagging. Mm -hmm. And... To do that, you have to have a level of food safety set up. Mm -hmm. And so um, at the level I'm at, I'm selling what are called raw agricultural products. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it would be a head of lettuce versus a lettuce that is like in small little pieces that are microgreens with all the surface area. In. So when people chop a head of lettuce, they understand they've got to wash it and process it. And otherwise, you get into a situation where you know, food poisoning is a, is a risk. Um, it's always a risk, but it's just a lot more risky to sell fresh greens that are that are in a state where people think they can just start eating them. Some yeah. open source automation would I'm be good there with uh, something that uses ozone to kill right. off all the microbes. Right. I think ozone is one of those. It's it's your air, so that's a common substance. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And bubble bubble a bath like put in a yeah. bath and bubble ozone through yeah you could do something like that but again that's like a that's a big setup somewhere right and um yeah there's so many projects to do you know i'm trying to finish my greenhouse i'm trying to finish building the shelving in my cellar i'm trying to finish the enclosure of this one fenced in area i'm trying to build a a, a simple sort of structure that has like hardware cloth on it that I can dump produce on and, and hose mm -hmm. it off so I'm not bent over doing it in, in yeah. buckets and stuff, you know. For the There's like a zillion things to build. You probably know that. Oh, yes. So for the things that <laughs> that you, you produce for $1,200, what would that be worth if you bought that at a store? Oh, you know, probably twice that much. You know, but the thing, the thing that we talk about is that the stuff in the store is won a beauty contest. Sure. There's, there's very little tolerance outside of that. Our stuff, it's like, yeah, that pepper has a little blemish, but you know what? It's fine. So we're going to give it to them. And then um, also they don't have free choice. They're kind of getting what, what we've got. So we figure, you know, it's, it's a fair deal to get, you know, we're giving them kind of wholesale prices. Um, but it's a lot less hassle for us and a lot less waste. A lot of farmers that grow for, for farmers markets and stores, one of the hardest things they have to do is throw out like, you know, 50% of their stuff. <laughs> That's insanity, yeah. Yeah, it is insanity. Mm -hmm. and that's why there's this whole, so there's a, this whole uh, stuff called um, imperfect produce now, you know, where they're, oh, you can is that sign a thing up to now? get the rejects. Uh-huh. Yeah. Where is that? Is that at stores or at CSAs? No, it's usually it's like a like a delivery service kind of thing. If you look, I don't know if it's in your area, but I think what they do is they go they go because there's there are um, 
they're distributors for produce all over the nation, and they basically they ship in and then go. And there's always rejects. Oh wow! So, Ugly pro produce delivered to you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So I think they're just take they're taking from that distribution centers cheaply and reselling it. Huh. Yeah. All right. So our our ugly stuff gets eaten anyway, so we're happy. Yeah. Well, the CSA is ugly produce. <laughs> of course. I try to make it nice. I try to make it nice. <laughs> no, there's no, some but... beauty queens in there, but yeah, there is there is some <laughs> ugly stuff too. <laughs> no, that's not a yeah. not a slander. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. what are you guys? Are you growing anything there yet? Well, we've got the hazelnuts research stuff. We've got. We did the aquaponics greenhouse where we did lettuce and tilapia that we harvested. Still, fridge is full of that still. Oh, nice. But we've got an orchard, a bunch of orchard stuff. But it's all no maintenance. Like right now, it's just going wild. And and but we're gonna get that right. to um, to an, uh, a CSA operation and growing food for us on site. We haven't done that. Uh, got a solid farm manager here yet. So so we're gonna work on that and. Probably next year we'll yeah. have a person that's running an operation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's something someone you outsource that, have a, have someone on there to do it instead of you try to do it for sure. That's yeah. Great. Yeah, and definitely try to do all the best practices and so it's it's really a yeah. R and D farm. Yeah. And test your equipment. Yes, your equipment yeah. on your farm. That's great. Yeah. Thing that have a we professional farmer like Thing we really liked was a forest. I don't know if you've heard about a forest. Uh, a forest? Yeah, it's this Miyawaki method. Do, do you know that stuff? A forest, uh, two Fs and two Ts. But basically you do this three foot deep ground preparation with heavy machines, and then you plant a super dense planting of trees. And that mm. stuff grows fast, like so fast. So we're going to do a bunch of that here. So basically it's like, if I think about key lines, I would think about a forest line so that you get the plants just exploding out of that. But also the, that's about mycelium because you put straw and, and dung in there as you prepare the soil. So the thought is oh. you have a body of water at the bottom of the land. Uh, start that trench there and the mycelium is your natural irrigation system that takes the water to the top of the hill. So that's the kind of concept. That, oh, imagine that. Now you're displacing the need for artificial irrigation because you got the fungi uh, being the pipes for you. That would be cool. Yeah. So that's the kind I of don't, stuff you I want don't to know. do. That's Great question. I've never heard of fungi moving water as significant like that. I mean, nutrients and stuff exchange, but I guess it could be water too, of course. Yeah. I don't see why not water either, because also what do fungi produce? They exhale water. So hmm, right. they are getting you water. And yeah. I haven't seen anyone really, I haven't really looked much for it, but that's an obvious idea. Like once you bring Elaine Ingham and a forest mm -hmm. and key lines together. It's obvious. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it would be great. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So I got to get going. Do we have to cover anything else? or? I think we're good. I'm excited okay. about it. Uh, I'll let you know when the show's coming out and mm -hmm. um, so you can share it, okay? So that's, it should be really good. Hopefully yeah. The recordings are clean. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And once we're starting our. All right. Our uh, CSA, I might call up on you yeah. for some hints. Yeah, anytime. Call me. Yeah. Call me anytime. And my son is the one who's really into, into um, machines and stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn them on to your stuff again. I think yeah. I've shown it before, but that was years ago. Okay. Yeah, All right. Cool. Now. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Good care. talking to you. Good talking. Bye-bye.